Amen again, and thank you so much, uh, praise team, for your um, desire to bring us into this place of worship, and uh, I pray your desire is the same, and I'm going to ask you, if you will, as we continue to worship the Lord in, uh, in, in the, the looking at His Word from Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount, we'll get back to, uh, to that. Matthew chapter 5, uh, we'll be at verse 13. Going through now and just preaching what's next. You know, we're returning to the Sermon on the Mount today. But if you notice, we're right between blessing, which we've certainly looked at in verses 1 through 12, and the fulfillment of the law. Many of you are here a couple of Sundays ago, and you see that the, the fulfillment of the law is featured for us in verses 17 through 20. So we have blessing and obedience. And so what is between blessing and obedience? What's that section that we left out? And I don't say 13 through 16, okay? That's, you're right, but that's not what we're looking for. What we're looking for is we want to find that, that middle ground between blessing and obedience. Now, to put this thought into your head, uh, to kind of give a description of, of what is to come in this sermon today, uh, I want, as it appears on your screen, from 1 Corinthians 6, 20. 1 Corinthians 6, 20 says this. It says, listen, you were bought with a price. It was a high price. It was the king of heaven came down to earth to give his life a ransom for us, his life for our death. Okay? The miraculous transfer of life uh, from a holy God that had and knew no sin, as we just sang about. That life was transferred into us who deserve nothing but death because of the, the sin and our chasing after sin and our desire to, to be sinful. So you were bought with a price. And if that's the case, therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. Okay? So I want to kind of put that into your head before we move on. For this, you were purchased by God through the blood and grace of Jesus Christ. And that signifies the blessing that we are talking about. That blessing that, that we looked at in verses 1 through 12, or that is in your scriptures in, in chapters 5 of Matthew 1 through 12. And that's the blessing we're talking about. Now that blessing, or blessedness, we'll call it, that is what places us in the realm of separateness from this world, okay? All right, if you look at those very carefully, it explains how we are separate, all right? We are not of this world. We may be in it, but we are not of it. And, and, and therefore, that separateness from this worldly lust, we'll call it, also places us in the position of God of holiness, okay? We are a set-apart people. All right? You got that? That's the blessing end. Okay? Now, therefore, glorifying God in your body, says 1 Corinthians 6, 20, the second part. Glorifying God in your body and in your spirit or your soul or your innermost being, which now belong to God, is the same wording as that of Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. Okay? Now, we'll get to that in a minute. You just go ahead and, and plug that into your head. Which this is this. It is the fulfillment of Christ and our obedience to his word or to his law. Okay? So we're finding ourselves with this particular sermon today of Matthew 5, 13 through 16. Somewhere in the middle between blessing and obedience. Well, what do you find? If those of you that went and picked up a sermon notes on your way in, you already, you're cheating because it's already written down for you. What is it that we find in the middle of blessing and obedience is this. It is responsibility. Responsibility. Now, this is not a civics class, okay? This is not a success 101 class. But I'm going to tell you, folks, the church has going to have to understand and know responsibility, okay? I said last week, it's time for us. It's past time for us to be serious, okay? You're putting signs up in your yard 
Billy Graham is endorsing the fact that we need to vote on Tuesday to, to settle the issue in North Carolina that marriage is between a man and a woman. Who in the world would ever thought that we would bring that to the table? Okay? So I'm telling you, church, it is time for us to, to, to stand. Either to stand or quit. Either stand or die. That's it. That's our choices. And so there is some responsibility that is laid upon us. And it is sandwiched in between two great places. Blessing and obedience. Okay? Now this is conveyed to us as we read today our text, Matthew 5, 13 through 16. As we begin here in verse 13, it says this. You are the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth. The earth needs salt, apparently, and you're it. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? Okay? It's good for nothing then to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You also, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket. No, they don't. They put it on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. So, here's our verse. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Let the light of Christ shine in you, blessing, that they may see your good works, obedience, and glorify your Father in heaven. Our responsibility. Okay? So, let's look at salt and light today. Alright? First of all, we'll do it in order and we'll go with salt. Salt. Now I want to ask you this. Now I thought about this a little bit here. Have you ever heard of salt going bad? Yeah, when I read this, I said, well, you know, salt loses its flavor. It's good for nothing. You just throw it out. Okay? But in my house, we don't do a whole lot of cooking. Real cooking. You know? And, and I'm going to tell you this, too. I, uh, you, know, I, you know, I'm the health freak now. Who would ever thought Eric Real would be a health nut? You know? I'm serious. God can change people. Okay? And, and, and we got a salt shaker that sits on the top of the stove, and nobody ever touches it. You know, but every now and again, every now and again, I'm trying to think of what it is that I do like a little salt in. Ah, my grits. Okay? And so I'll put a little salt in there from a salt shaker that's probably 10 years old, and it's still salty. It's still salty. You know, I can taste it right out of the chute. It's still salty. And so some of y'all saying, do not ever go to Eric Reel's house and eat because of the, you know, but that's, okay, if you want to come to my house, bring food. I'm fine with that, all right? I'm fine with that. So, I've never heard of salt going bad or losing its saltiness. Because, you know, here's the thing. In the ancient world, and, and, the, and by the way, the world's not so ancient, okay? Because salt was used as a preservative. Uh, that's what salt did. Uh, and, and, and by the way, it's not so ancient because any of y'all ever eat country ham? Okay, country ham, salty, isn't it? It's good, but it's not, it wasn't made to be salty. It was made because, you know, even a hundred years ago or whatever it was, they would cure the meat by salting it down. And, and here's what happened. They would salt it down so that the meat could persevere, okay? So that the meat would last and it would be of use and of value through long periods of time. Okay? You hang the meat up in the smokehouse and salt it down real good and you can come back a long time later, cut it off, and that's good eat. Amen? Don't be shaking your head. You ain't from here. Okay? So, shush. I'm talking. Verse 14. Verse 14 tells us that salt that loses its flavor or the ability to persevere or its purpose in, in keeping the meat valued, that salt that loses its power is this. It's imitation salt. It's not real salt. It's cheap salt. You know, maybe at that time it may be a little salt mixed with a little sawdust or something. I don't know. Okay? It's weak salt. 
Salt that loses its saltiness is, is imitation, it's cheap, and it's weak. It's not the real stuff. Okay? That's what I want to convey to you here. Now, where does salt come from? All right? You know, this is obviously a, an illustration from the ancient world. So this salt here comes from, this is salt that has been processed. Okay? Or filtered out of the sea. And, and by the way, the salt sea or dead sea is a good source that they had back then. And, and, and or, or it's salt that is gathered from, from soil or dirt. Okay? Now the thing is this, if you take some water out of the, out of the, out of the ocean, okay? You take it, let the water evaporate, what do you got left? You got salt, okay? You got salt, but you got salt that will eventually die out, all right? You take, um, here's, here's one thing that animals do. You know, I learned this from PBS kids. Elephants eat dirt. And why they eat dirt is because there's salt in it, all right? It's salt in various minerals. But, um, but the point here is that the salt that was available had the ability to become unsalty. So if we're the salt of the earth, and, 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 and by the way, we do know, and God knew that there would come a time where we, we would know where to get real salt. Okay? So he included this scripture for us even in ancient time because he knew what was going on. He knew what would come. He knew that I would be preaching on this on this particular day. So let me ask you this, or let me tell you this. Salt that lasts. Salt that perseveres. Salt that preserves is salt that is mined. Okay? It comes out of a mine. Alright? It's deep within the earth. And, 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 you know, and people, you, you mine it out, okay? It's not the stuff that's just laying there on the side of the beach. It's not the stuff that, you, that splashes up on a rock, okay? It's not that at all. Here's where this salt that lasts, the salt that lasts comes from deep within. Did you get that? Salt that, this mined salt comes from deep within and it has lasting power and I'm going to just go ahead and tell you you are the salt of the earth so your salt comes from Christ okay if you are truly the salt of the earth and not this imitation stuff your salt is Christ okay now this isn't a message about the properties of salt okay but if scripture is comparing us to salt then these properties do apply to us and let me see if I can transition some of that for you. Our responsibility to the law of God. Our responsibility to the law of God that comes from blessing of Jesus Christ himself, of us being and practicing holiness, is responsibility that lasts. You with me? That's the responsibility that lasts or perseveres in times of testing or trial. Okay? Imitation salt is going to evaporate whenever the, 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 the trials of life come and wash over it, if you want me to use that terminology, okay? The salt that lasts, the salt that lasts is going to stick. It's going to stay there, okay? Now, I said this, it comes from deep within, okay? If you want to get real salt, you go to a mine. You go to a mine, and you go deep down into the earth, and you dig out this salt that has been there for, since the foundations of the earth were laid, I guess, all right? Now, metaphorically applying that to our lives our salt our ability to preserve our ability to help those persevere it comes deep within okay it comes deep within now here's the lesson for you that you're not going to like all right because you've heard it and you've heard it and you've heard it and I'm gonna keep telling it and telling it and tell it until you do it do it do it and it is this you want you want salt that lasts it comes deep within, and it comes from this, a deep, careful study, and therefore dependence in and upon the Word of God. Okay? Now, I'm going to tell you, most of you in here are getting your Bible study lesson today. And when do you think your next one's going to be? Next Sunday. And if that's the case, you know what you're doing? You're not mining any salt. I'm just telling you straight up, okay? You want me to be honest with you, right? You're not mining any salt, okay? You're depending on, and I'm not going to say, you're depending on cheap salt. 
Hey, I'll give me a dose next Wednesday. I'll give me a dose next uh, Sunday even. You know, that kind of thing. Now, that's not going to... When, when, when the trials of the week come on, what are you going to do then? Well, I will, I will, I'll accept these trials. I will beat down these trials. I will be beaten up. I will be beaten down. And then Sunday, Eric Real is going to pick me back up. But let me tell you another thing. Eric Real is imitation salt. I'm weak salt. That's as good as I can do. Now, I want you to dig in. I want us to dig in. Okay? I want us to dig in and study the Word of God. Knowledge of the Word of God, the law of God, that has lasting power. Okay? And Christ our Lord. Christ our Lord is lasting power. Our opinion of Christ can waver. Okay? It can. Our opinion of Christ can waver, but our knowledge of Christ never wavers. Okay? The thing is this. I spoke uh, uh, Wednesday at our 622 service, and I usually started out with this, that God is good. And I know I've used it in here plenty of times because we have a little cliche that we like to say, God is good, and all the time, do you believe that? Really? Do you believe that when the mess of life hits you in the face? Do you believe that when you find the cancer cell? You know, when it's growing in you? And then we say, all the time, God is good. So what I'm saying is our opinion of Christ can waver. Well, I don't know if he's so good or not, you know. If he's so good, why did I get this? Our knowledge of Christ in his word never wavers. When I see it in the word of God and I apply it to my heart, when I use the word of God as a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path, and I hide his words in my heart so that I may not sin against God, that's when it becomes lasting, persevering, Salt, faith, and responsibility. The responsibility is this, that, that you mine it out. You mine it out. Mine it out in your own way, the Word of God that lasts and perseveres. Okay? Now, when we do that, when we do that, when we are deep entrenched with the responsibility to God and His law, digging it out for ourselves, it will make you to know how to do this, to glorify your Father in heaven instead of blaming Him for everything that goes wrong in your life. We will learn to do this. We will learn to glorify Him for He truly is worthy. He truly is worthy. You know how I know? Because His Word says He is. And so therefore, we, we glorify our Father in heaven. So says verse 16. So says Second Peter. It will make us, when we mine out the Word of God for ourselves. It will make us to glorify our Father in heaven. And it also do this. It will also make you know how to take a stand. It will make you know how to stand. Okay? Go with me. It will appear on the screen, I do believe, because I don't want you to lose your place in Matthew because we'll be going to light here in just a moment. But Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6. This is that full arm of God passage. Okay? Beginning with verse 13, it says this. Therefore, take up. All right, what kind, of, what kind of phrases take up? Does that sound like you got anything to do here? Does it, sound, does it sound like some sort of responsibility that we as the church must take part in? Somebody say amen if that's what you agree to. Okay, three of you got it. All right. Take up the armor, the whole armor of God. Okay, take it up. Put it on. That you might be able to withstand in the evil day all right, first of all, withstanding. And then the second of all, having done all to stand. All right, that's responsibility right there. That's responsibility. Stand, verse 14, therefore, having girded your waist with truth. I'm going to give you one guess to find out where you find truth. Where do you find truth? Word of God. Okay. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness. I bet you can find righteousness in the word of God as well. And having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And above all, taking the shield of faith with which you are able to quench the fiery darts that the wicked one is going to sling at you. Okay? Verse 17. Put on the helmet of salvation. And as you do all those things, notice this. That those are all defensive weapons. Those are all defensive weapons, 
okay? I'm protecting my head, I'm protecting my breast, I'm protecting my, shoot, my feet, you know, I'm protecting with a shield, I'm protecting, those are all defensive weapons. But then it says this, finishing that verse says, and the sword of the Spirit, sword of God, take it. Now, by the way, the sword is your offensive weapon. That's the one you, you know, when you go into a fight, you don't take your helmet off and throw it at them. No, you don't. You take that sword, okay? And the sword, which is what? The Word of God, my friends. The Word of God. There is your offense against the evil of this world. There is the, 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 the thing that you can stand with. You know, if you have a weapon, you can stand, okay? If you have a weapon, you are able to stand. And you can stand, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Okay? So there we have it. I believe God is telling us that the Word of God is paramount in our lives and for us to know who God is and able to withstand the pressures, the trials, the trouble, the, the evil of this world. Okay? Be salt that comes from deep within. I said here, I said, it will make you know how to glorify God in heaven. Study, a careful study, a careful in-depth mining out of the truth of God will, will, will help you to glorify your Father in heaven. It will make you know how to stand. And I'm going to tell you this too, folks. And I don't know exactly where everybody stands. I hope I got a real good feeling about this. But it will make you know how to vote. You hear me? Standing on the Word of God. And I don't care what the stupid ads are out there saying. And by the way, I don't care if the truth of the matter is that every right in America would be taken away if you vote against this. You still need to be voting for it. And that's the truth. Because this is God's law. Now you can stand with man's law if you want to. But I'm going to tell you, where are you going to stand when it is time to stand? It'll make you know how to vote. It will make you know how to vote. When the Word of God is marginalized, I've heard this term over and over and over in the Christian community on how we're facing this particular vote. Okay? When the Word of God is marginalized. Now, does anybody know what marginalized means? I looked it up. It means not of central importance. So when the Word of God is not of central importance, but then we begin to believe the lies of Satan, you know, we can see other things even ungodly things that justify the swaying of an opinion or an action. Now, by the way, the opposition ads, they've all been proven to be lies. You know why they're lies? Because they're from the devil. You know what the devil does? He lies. You know? So the thing is this. You're not going to hurt any child in America. You're not going to hurt any woman in America by voting the just law of God. Responsibility comes here when you get up off of your couch and go to the polls and vote. Marginal or cheap or imitation or powerless responsibility is worth nothing more than to be thrown out and make you a fine path out of it. Have you ever thought about this? Here's a thought that went across my distorted mind. Y'all know it kind of goes every now and again, goes out in a weird place. If I sit here before a crowd of people on Sunday morning and tell them about my undergarments, I know for my own self that I'm a strange one, okay? But I'm thinking this, powerless, imitation, cheap, marginal responsibility, according to the Word of God, is worth nothing more than to be thrown out and make a path out of it that will supply the needs of the bottom of your shoes. That's all it's good for. That's all that imitation responsibility is good for. It makes a fine path for the bottom of your shoes. Okay? Now, have you ever thought what's on the bottom of your shoes? If you live on a farm, I can tell you exactly what's on the bottom of your shoes. Okay? All right? That's, that's where the garbage is. You know, when you step in gum. Oh, man! And that's all that kind of faith and responsibility is good for. When you place it in, in, in marginalized ideas. But when you place it in the truth of God, 
between truth of God, the truth of God, it never loses its saltiness and it will never be set out on a path. It will guide you into all truth. Our responsibility to God as salt is a high commodity that we can never take lightly. We can never take it lightly. Okay? Our handling of the blessing that God has on this end mixed with the word of God the responsibility or the obedience to it is paramount in knowing God and, and being known by Him and making Him known to all the world. Salt, real salt, real mind salt, real mind true responsibility will bring the world to Christ if we are willing. So, that's salt. Now light. Light. Now, as I, I, don't, I don't think I want to reread this for lack of time, but we've read it and it hadn't been that long ago. You are the light of the world, and a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. You know, if you are truly light, if you are truly light, then you really want to be seen, don't you? I mean, you really want to be seen. I went camping with my boys for the first time uh, two weeks ago. You know, two weeks ago, went out in the backyard because I wasn't going all the way to South Mountain and driving home at midnight if we had to. If we had to go home at midnight, we were just going to walk across the yard and be fine, right? But it worked out great. And the reason it worked out great is because they had this lantern. Now, the lantern was the hit of the evening, okay? All right? Now, this Coleman lantern is one that's battery-powered. It's got a three-point fluorescent bulb in it. It's not them kind that we had and you know what I'm talking about if you ever went camping and your mantle disintegrated but anyway my boys were fascinated over the light okay I mean it was like 92 degrees but we had to build a fire okay who can camp without a fire not so much that we needed the heat but we needed the light you got it so you know if you are truly light then you really do want to be seen. Okay, now not to boast or to brag, but to help. Okay, to help. Power goes off in your house. What you looking for? Where's that flashlight? You know? And then, of course, the next time the power goes off, or, or after the power comes on, then you have new batteries put in the flashlight, and it is in this special drawer, and if anybody ever touches it, banishment. Okay? Because of our love for light all right our love for light if you are truly light then you truly want to be seen not to brag or to boast but to help that's what light does light is always the first thing we desire when darkness invades our life you ever left your home when it was daylight and returned it was dark and the first thing you hear is you didn't leave a light on well it was a light when I left and then, as soon as you get home, as soon as you get the door unlocked, as soon as all the fumbling and arguing is over, what do you do? Flip the switch and get the place illuminated. That's what light is. And, and you know, man, we love light. We love light. Well, let me, let, me, let me introduce you. Not introduce, but reintroduce or explain a light that you love, child of God. The light of Christ. John 1, 1 through 5. John 1, 1 through 5 says this. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God in the beginning. The Word was God in the beginning. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. And of course, this is referring to our Savior, Jesus Christ, and if you read on through verse 14, it certainly identifies Him as the one who was made flesh and dwelt among us. But as we look at these characteristics of Jesus Christ, we see in verse 3 that all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. I'm sorry, I already read that. Verse 4, in him was life. And the life was the light of men. In him is life. And so therefore, in him is light. The first thing we want when we encounter darkness. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not comprehend it. 
It doesn't understand it. It cannot conquer it. And by the way, light can always drive out darkness. Darkness can never cover light. It can never do it. Okay? So, it is, uh, or excuse me, Christ illuminates us. Okay? And if the light of Christ is in you, then you can't hide it. You don't want to hide it because that that is in us is going to be a help to others. You don't want to hide it. The light is Christ. Now, relating our scripture also, I want to to relate it this way, in that light is also enlightenment. It's not only illumination that, you know, you drive away the dark, but it's also enlightenment. Now, when we're looking at our scripture, we're somewhere between blessing and obedience. We're in the zone of responsibility, okay? When he says, you are the light, you are the light, that means this, you are responsible You are responsible to what you know. Okay? Okay, child of God? Okay, Christian? All right? You are responsible to that that you already know. That that has been enlightened to you. That that has been refreshed. And the Spirit of God, through the Word of God, comes to you and brings a point of, of, of to your attention. You are forever responsible for it. You are forever responsible to lead, guide, follow do whatever the Word of God says for you to do. That's enlightenment. Okay? You are responsible. You are responsible to to that that you know, to that what you have been given, that that you have been blessed with. And by the way, you are responsible to know more. You are responsible to know more. We used this passage not long ago uh, in the passage that you are responsible to work out your salvation. Okay? Okay? to make it, to mold it, to fit it to your lifestyle so that you can be a blessing, so that you can glorify God and be a blessing to others. I want you to recall this. You know, if you want to just glance back up at 1 through 12, I just picked out a few of my favorites. Blessedness, that, that living in that zone of separateness or holiness. Blessedness comes to those who hunger and thirst for it. That sounds to me like Responsibility. Those who hunger and thirst for it, you will receive it. Okay? You will receive the blessing. Blessedness is is for those who have been given mercy. In order to do what? So you can give mercy. All right? Blessedness is, is on those, is to those who seek purity. You know, the pure in heart. Those who seek purity, because here's the thing. Those who do that, you'll see God. You will see God. Blessed, blessedness are on those who make peace because they'll become sons and daughters of God because God is the prince of peace blessedness are on those who endure those who pers- or, 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 uh, excuse me, persevere through persecution that's the case to you guys it is the kingdom of heaven my with what such blessedness comes such responsibility for us to be the light of the world. Let me back up for just a second. It said this, the, the, the light of the world, you're like, a, you're like a city built on a hill. Okay? Now that's a metaphor that they used then to understand, hey, I can see the city afar off. But you know, here's one thought of mine. You ever flown and you fly in at night? You're flying at night, man, I'm telling you, that city can't be hidden. You know, it can't be hidden. And, and thank God the runway lights cannot be hidden. You know, the pilot of that plane is depending upon that. He's depending upon what? Light. And the light is Christ. And it is the light of men. It is the light for, for all available. So I think, you know, we as the church, as a matter of fact, I don't think I know. I've, I've seen this in the scripture that we have a responsibility. And I'm going to close this way with verse 16. With verse 16, as a challenge to all of us, as a challenge, that challenge being, um, finding my notes here, yeah, let your light so shine before men. Now, let, what does that mean? What does that mean? That means you have the responsibility to allow it to happen. Okay? That's up to you. It is up to you. It is up to us. It is up to the church of God to spread the message of, of, of love and light and salt 
in a world that needs it, in a world that needs, pers- or, or, it needs perseverance, it needs preserving. Let or allow or cause your light, that blessing that Christ is in you, to let it shine so that those may see it. What are they going to see? They're going to see your good works. That's what it says, you know. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works, that they may see in you Christ. And, and by the way, what did we say about light? Can't be hidden. Another thing about light, people are drawn to it. They're drawn to it. All right? Just go sit out in the woods. Go sit out in the woods and wait for it to get dark. Not now while that full moon's doing its thing. Okay? Wait for that to go away. Go sit in the woods and see which direction you go. Somebody flick a lighter, there's where you're going to head. Okay? There's where you're going to head. All right? So... People are drawn to this light. Now, what are we to do with this light? According to this challenge of verse 16, they'll see your good works and they will glorify your Father in heaven. They will glorify your Father in heaven. And when Christ is lifted up, he draws men into himself. Okay? To glorify God. God is light. And his light is in you. So let's just finish up with this. God is light, amen, and his light is in you, amen, then show it off. That's all I'm asking. That's all Christ is asking. Let me out of you to show it off. Just show it off, you know. Present, here he is, here is God. Be the avenue of light and life of Christ so that our world may be saved. Awesome responsibility, isn't it? It's, it's, it is. It's a wonderful task that we've been blessed to receive and obedience will get us there. So, amen. Thank you so much for your attention. Um, Dave, you got a little praise or active music that would maybe cause us to do this. Dave, come on up and, uh, and, and let's reflect on what we just heard. Okay? Let's reflect on what we just heard. And I want you, uh, you know, I don't want to challenge you. I don't want to embarrass anybody and I don't want to say, oh, you know, rush yourself down here and let me pray over you. That don't do it. That don't do it because you have all heard the word. Okay? Now, as I understand it, for us to serve the Lord correctly requires faith. Right? Right? And as I also understand it, Scripture tells us that faith comes by hearing. You've all heard. We've all heard. Now allow this challenge of, of, of God, from God, for us to be salt and light in a community that needs salt and light. And our faith will be increased as we enjoy these that, that share with us uh, in song. And I'm going to ask you to stand. Enjoy it as well. But reflect reflect on what God would have you do and how he would have you change. God bless you all. Thank you so much.